southwest part of the United States lies a harsh yet beautiful land. civilization thrived here. It was here that the culture of this civilization was formed. is the home of many Native Americans who settled here centuries ago. The Hopi, the Utes, the Zuni, and the largest nation of them all, the Navajos. Much of the Navajo cultural heritage is embodied in tribal legends, stories which have been passed on from generation to generation for many centuries. The central and recurring character in the legends is the coyote, an anti-hero whose activities reflect a type of social behavior unacceptable to the Navajo people. They are essentially morality tales, goodness in the form of the coyote's enemies, inevitably triumphs. There's no shortage of storytellers, and although the stories are usually told by men of the older generation to the younger generation, sometimes they are told by women as well. <laughs> But storytellers can be heard by just so many, and until recent years, the Navajos had no written language in which to record the stories. And now, after centuries of telling and retelling, after lifetime after lifetime of serving as an expression of the morals of the Navajo society, the tales of trotting coyote are going to be told to a new audience, in a manner never envisioned by the old Navajo storytellers. The project started here, in San Juan County, Utah. Kent Tibbetts, Lynn Lee, and Don Mose Jr. of the Indian Education Center at Blanding felt that a broader dissemination of the legends than was possible in a traditional way would serve several useful purposes. They believe the modern Navajo youngster would discover a more positive self-image by having these stories available to him in his classroom. And they felt that non-Indian school children would arrive at a greater understanding of the Navajo people. Because the stories employed a dramatic device of attributing human characteristics to animals, animation was indicated as the audio-visual technique. Furthermore, it was important that the Navajo people themselves have a direct involvement in the project. This, this Indian students designed the characters and decided among themselves which was to serve as the model for a trotting coyote. Don Mose, cultural specialist for the school district, coordinated the various stages of the project. Yeah, that seems good. It looks pretty good, though. I like it. Let's see how this... After settling on the design of the main character, the students designed other characters who play roles in the series. Where he, where he comes in, we've got him standing up, like on the research boards. You know, it's, where is this going to go now? Because of the desire for direct involvement and for reasons of economy, the people at the Indian Education Center chose as a production company a young organization that has brought the modern technology of the computer to the art of the animated motion picture. The company is Computer Image Corporation of Denver, Colorado, and they've developed and built a computer system that serves as an electronic tool for the imaginative filmmaker. They call it Caesar. Animate the eyes, is that right? That's right, but it is going to be very quick. 
This is the cotolith that we will use, and it's made into six sections here, and the drawings are covered with grayscale. This grayscale allows the computer to pick the individual sections and their color, and color them any way you want. With this system, the number of drawings required for an animated film is drastically reduced. We are able to repeat those colors because we can read voltages off of the computer. Mm -hmm. So why don't we take a look at this on the computer and see how it animates. The sectioned artwork is scanned by a special pickup camera, and the signal from this camera is fed into the computer. Human beings provide the direction which makes a sophisticated tool a servant of the human mind. And although the computer removes most of the drudgery from the art of animation, people must supply the ideas. Using a single piece of artwork instead of the hundreds required in traditional animation, the computer operator assembles the elements of the character created by the Indian students. He adds color electronically to the character, which is drawn in shades of gray. A final adjustment is made. Then, using the computer's simple controls, the animator imparts movement to the character. Computer Image's unique system allows the director to comment, instruct, and rehearse the scene just as he would in a live action setup. Let's see it one more time. What do you think, Don? I like that, Ron. Can you make it a little slower? Okay, fine. Why don't we start with the original Psycho Marsh. Uh, frame 1 to 5, and then we've got uh, 5 to 11, etc., etc. While he's doing this, why don't we set up the background? Dominic? A background scene has been prepared in color. It is placed before a color camera and combined with a computer animation to complete the scene. Okay, Jay, start your retearing now. When the director is happy with the action, color, and timing, the scene is recorded onto videotape. That looks like Keeper, Jay. Let's see a playback on that, please. Scene after scene is recorded in much the same manner with a computer always under human direction. When all the scenes are completed, they will be edited into a final yeah, version. That's it. I want to cut in just before movement on the thing. Okay, let's look at the whole thing.
sound will be added, and the finished videotape production will be converted to film for classroom use. <laughs> When these film stories of trying coyote are seen in the classroom by young Navajo children, the scene might parallel one in which Anglo pupils first see the fables of Aesop. Both point to a desirable pattern of social behavior. Both use animals which have human characteristics. And both sometimes contain violent behavior. In this story of the coyote and the skunk, the lazy coyote calls up a rain to fill the arroyo so he can float rather than walk to his destination. He outlines a plan to skunk, which will get them a free dinner at the expense of other animals. The coyote plays dead, and the skunk encourages the little animals to believe their feared enemy is no more. He tells them to see for themselves. They celebrate with a dance. Skunk diverts the little animals in the way only a skunk can. <laughs> In the confusion, coyote and skunk destroy the dancers. Kayo plots to get the entire supply of food for himself. He proposes a race and gives Skunk a head start. Skunk quickly hides and Coyote races off. <laughs> Skunk calmly collects the food, sits high on a rock, and allows Coyote nothing more than a few bones. <laughs> now the children in this bilingual classroom are led through a discussion of the stories to determine how their understanding of their tribal legends and of acceptable social behavior has been enriched by seeing the film. Okay, Galbert, what were the um, animals doing around the coyote? Dancing around the coyote? Yeah. See, who scared the coyote? Um, crow. Good. Norman, good lady, she had to live so hard, that's a... Honesty. Uh-huh, I'll just show you that. 
Teresa, why were the um, animals dancing around? Because the coyote was playing dead. Were they happy? Yeah. The film that we saw about For many of these youngsters, both Anglo and Indian, it is their first exposure to these ancient legends. And without the films, they might never have heard them. And the coyote ran all the way to the mountain that he said he was going to run to. And back where behind him, Skunk got all the meat and he ate it all, didn't he? As a footnote, it is ironic that an ancient fuel pumped from beneath the Indian's land its source marked by the incessant gurgle of these machines casting shadows across the home of Trotting Coyote would provide part of the money to produce this series. It is true, however, that oil royalties, money from these wells, have helped bring the legends of their tribe back to the Indian children.